Thanks very much, Joe. And thanks, everyone, for being here, joining us today. So our, our forum is uh, today will be primarily based on the thematic developments in three books that were published in the last 15 years. The first one is Irreducible Mind Towards a New Psychology of the 21st Century. Uh, it is a book not designed for the casual reader. Uh, it's an 800 page book designed for advanced undergraduates or graduate level students in the field of cognitive science. The basis for it originated in a 1998 seminar given by a group of professors and professional researchers headed by Dr. David Edward uh, F. Kelly, experimental psychiatrist, neuroscientist, and research professor at the University of Virginia Department of per Perceptual Studies. Uh, its purpose was or is to examine the theoretical foundations of modern scientific psychology. Published in 2007, it represents the fruition of more than a decade of effort and covers an impossibly enormous range, uh, a summary of the primary theoretical developments coupled with an extensive assortment of empirical studies in Western psychology since the early 1900s. The authors begin with William James, frequently referred to as the father of Western psychology and his mentor, a largely forgotten genius, according to Kelly, named Frederick W. H. Myers. Myers in two volume, and a two volume work on the human personality uh, published in 1903, assembled a considerable number of case studies documenting a wide variety of parapsychological phenomena. This included clairvoyance and telepathy, precognition and past life recollection, genius and mystical experiences, psychokinesis and psychometry, mediumship, mesmerism, uh, and hypnotism, among many others. And that whole uh, group of topics is what is commonly referred to as psi, P-S-I, phenomena. So if you hear me reference that in the rest of the talk, that's what I'm referring to, the psi phenomena. Drawing upon diverse resources, Myers also attempted to formulate a general conception of human consciousness that could provide an initial framework for explaining them, that is, explaining all this phenomena. Kelly points out that this effort was not only continued by William James, but in the hundred or, year, hundred or so years since, a wealth of rigorously gathered and substantiated empirical evidence within the field further supports what Myers uh, uh, proposed and his perspective. Kelly also outlines how this psi research has been ignored or discredited by mainstream Western cognitive science because it cannot be adequately explained in a biophysicalist or materialist framework. And in a minute, we'll talk about what that is. When well, Kelly reminds us of the words of Francis Bacon, called the father of modern empiricism uh, and of the scientific method, the world is not to be narrowed till it will go into the understanding, but the understanding to be expanded and opened till it can take in the image of the world as it is in fact. When scientific opinion systematically ignores data, opinions harden into dogmas. Then instead of science, we have what's called scientism, a kind of uh, fundamentalist belief system or secular theology just as detrimental to the evolution of human understanding as any other dogma. In completing the survey, Dr. Kelly and the several co-authors came to the unanimous conclusion that, as we see quoted here, the materialist consensus which undergrids practically all of current mainstream psychology, neuroscience, and philosophy of mind is fundamentally flawed. 
Alternative models of consciousness, such as that which Myers and James attempted to offer, should be seriously reconsidered in order to galvanize a long-needed paradigm shift. So this is the fundamental um, theme of this first book. And it was followed by two others, um, published in 2015 and 2021, respectively. In Beyond Physicalism and Consciousness Unbound, Kelly enlists the assistance of a leading group of cognitive scientists, comparative religion professors, philosophers, and neuroscientists to formulate with greater precision the emerging paradigm of what he sees as a new psychology of the 21st century. This paradigm or paradigms are compatible with the most recent breakthroughs in physics along with the psi phenomena. They also draw from or are allied with classical and neoplatonic philosophy and diverse wisdom traditions, both East and West, as well as genius level independent thinkers such as Coleridge, Hegel, Spinoza, Leibniz, Emerson, and Thoreau. In doing so, they point to the deeper unifying, morally edifying, and holistic dimensions and purposes of human life. Kelly and his team are seeking to encourage and support a foundational reform they see taking place in modern psychology, a revolution akin to a Copernican shift, which could have wide repercussions in every field a quote from Kelly from Consciousness Unbound. The emerging vision sketched here in barest outline provides an antidote to the prevailing postmodern disenchantment of the world and demeaning of human possibilities. It not only more accurately and fully reflects our human condition, but also engenders hope and encourages ego surpassing forms of human flourishing. It offers reasons for us to believe that freedom is real, that our conscious choices matter, and that we have barely scratched the surface of our latent human potentials. It likewise addresses the urgent need for a greater sense of worldwide community and interdependence, a sustainable ethos, by showing that under the surface, we and the world are much more deeply and widely interconnected than previously realized. Our individual and collective human fates in these dangerous and difficult times, indeed, the fate of the precious planet and all of its passengers may ultimately hinge on wider recognition and more effective utilization of the expanded states of being that are potentially available to us, but largely ignored or even actively suppressed by our struggling postmodern civilization with its warring tendencies toward self-aggrandizing individualism and fundamentalist tribalism. He goes on, availability of an improved worldview does not guarantee its acceptance, of course, and even widespread acceptance would not guarantee that its potential benefits will be fully realized or its potential abuses adequately controlled, but a conception of the natural world much richer than the prevailing physicalism, one that is greatly superior in human terms and at the same time more consistent with leading edge science is now definitely within reach. There's no way to cover all the material presented in these volumes. So what we're going to attempt today is kind of a skimming overview in broad and loose brushstrokes uh, of what is presented with much greater detail and force in the books themselves. And we'll also add a few supporting examples from other sources. Dr. Kelly begins the introduction of Irresistible Mind by stating that the central subject matter of the book is, quote, the problem of relations between the inherently private, subjective, first person world of human mental life and the publicly observable, so-called objective, third person world 
of physiological events and processes in the body and brain. This, he says, is a fundamental dichotomy which scientific psychology has been struggling to reconcile ever since it began to distinguish itself from philosophy near the end of the 19th century. It was a, a dichotomy fully acknowledged in William James' Principles of Psychology, a monumental 1,200-page work that is still widely cited by many psychiatrists and psychologists today. While James systematically restated what little was known at the time about the neural centers of the brain, he avoided any reductionist conclusions. He was instead arguing that in order to establish itself as a science, mental processes would need to be approached with, quote, a radical and observant empiricism, and with all the diligence and precision that Galileo and Darwin applied to physical and biological phenomena. James was well aware of the difficult challenges facing the development of introspection as a viable method for the scientific exploration of the mind, but noted that such challenges were common to every kind of scientific observation. We could compare it, for example, to the centuries uh, long development uh, of the telescope. In every case, James wrote, what we choose to give our attention to and the qualities of the attentive faculty will determine what we find. Introspection is difficult and fallible, he said. The difficulty is simply that of observation of whatever kind. The only safeguard is in the final consensus of our farther knowledge about the thing in question, later views correcting earlier ones, until at last the harmony of a consistent system is reached. Neither James nor Myers was leaving out the value of a deductive process, such as the Upanishads and the Platonic uh, philosophy call for, but only that a rigorous empirical approach was also needed, including both first-person and third-person data theory confirmation. This synoptic approach to scientific psychology was soon largely abandoned, however, as Kelly outlines in much more detail than I'm going to uh, present today, uh, abandoned in favor of a much narrower conception. In 1913, J.B. Watson published the founding manifesto of behaviorism. Psychology was no longer the science of mental life, as James had defined it, but a science of behavior, and, quote, should never use the terms consciousness, mental states, mind, content, introspectively verifiable, imagery, and the like, unquote. Its task was instead to identify lawful relationships between stimuli and responses. Psychology has a quote, again, another quote from Watson. Psychology as the behaviorist views it is a purely objective experimental branch of natural science that needs introspection as little as do the sciences of chemistry and physics. The position is taken here that the behavior of man and the behavior of animals must be considered in the same place. Anxious to establish itself alongside the other highly successful empirical sciences, mainstream psychology in both America and Europe rapidly adopted the Pavlovian approach Quote, in a system of psychology completely worked out, given the response, the stimuli can be predicted, and given the stimuli, the response can be predicted. Despite its ascendancy, the juggernaut of behaviorism did not completely eclipse all alternatives. Carl Jung, Abraham Maslow, and Viktor Frankl, Frankl emerged, as did other forms of humanistic and transpersonal psychology. Published in 1946, Viktor Frankl's Man's Search for Meaning chronicled his experience, experiences in the Auschwitz and Koffering concentration camps, where he developed a theory of healing through meaning, known as logotherapy. 
He counseled thousands of fellow prisoners as well as countless patients after the war based on a philosophy that maintained that the transpersonal search for meaning and devotion to a higher purpose, not personal pleasure nor power, is what nourishes true health and sustains the will to live. Frankel was fond of quoting Nietzsche, Nietzsche, quote, a person who establishes the why can bear with almost any how, unquote. Frankel powerfully maintained that only if we posit the highest possibilities of what it means to be human will the individual begin to realize, to enact, and to embody what is possible in any given life. He often quoted Goethe, if we take man as he is, we make him worse. But if we take him as he should be, we make him capable of becoming what he can be. The Will to Meaning sold over 12 million copies, and there's a documentary that was released in 2021 called Victor and I, which uh, anyone can uh, purchase online for, for $6, or rent, rather. It's uh, highly recommended. It's a remarkable person, individual, very insightful. Starting in 1950s, in the 1950s, however, a more sophisticated form of behaviorism arose, uniting the philosophical doctrine of functionalism with the logical theory of the Turing machine and the technological advances unleashed by the digital computer. The computational theory of the mind, called CMT, arose. The notion that the mind is an information processing system that can be modeled by powerful computer systems. It is a view that has dominated modern cognitive science to this day and is driving what appears to be an ever deepening marriage between psychology and neuroscience. In addition, in recent decades, brain researchers have begun, quote unquote, opening up the black box of the brain with an array of increasingly sophisticated clinical, pharmacological, biochemical, genetic, neurosurgical, electrophysiological, <laughs> and behavioral modalities. Every few years, new families of functional neuroimaging techniques, such as EEGs, fMRIs, and PETs, allow researchers to observe with ever-increasing temporal and spatial precision subtle physiological processes taking place in the interior of a functioning and intact human brain. Meanwhile, remarkable advances have been made in artificial intelligence under the premise that sophisticated algorithms can reproduce aspects of functional human intelligence. Kelly does not wish to deny these advances. He himself has done a great deal of professional work in these arenas, nor does he wish to limit the value they may eventually have if used for true human welfare. But his fundamental point of departure is the assumptions under which most of these efforts operate. And this is how he summarizes them. Human beings are nothing but extremely complicated biological machines. Everything we are and do is in principle causally explainable from the bottom up in terms of our biology, chemistry, and physics. Ultimately, that is, in terms of local contact interactions among bits of matter moving in strict accordance with mechanical laws under the influence of fields of force. The substrate of our general capacities to learn are built in genetically as complex resultants of biological evolution. Mind and consciousness are entirely generated by, or perhaps in some mysterious way identical with, neurophysiological events and processes in the brain. Mental causation, volition, and the self do not really exist. They are mere illusions, byproducts of the grinding of our neural machinery. And because one's mind and personality are entirely products of the bodily machinery, they will necessarily be extinguished totally and finally by the demise and dissolution of that body. And in case this sounds like an exaggeration, 
in September 2004, Newsweek informed its vast readership that top psychologist Steven Pinker, author of How the Mind Works, published in 1997, that contrary to everyone's everyday experience, that, quote, modern neuroscience has shown that there is no user of the brain. What we might call the I, the self, or the soul is in fact merely the, inform, quote, information processing of the brain. New imaging techniques have tied every thought and emotion to neural activity. Or as the physicalist turned neurobiologist Francis Crick declared, as Lewis Carroll's Alice might have phrased it, you're nothing but a pack of neurons. Fundamental assumptions like this have also led to the prevailing view that psychiatric illnesses are diseases of the brain, biological disorders caused by chemical imbalances which can be corrected by the right medication. This has helped to fuel the rise of a $1.5 trillion per year pharmaceutical industry, now the largest and wealthiest in the world. However, as Kelly and others have pointed out, despite the correlations that have been mapped with increasing precision between various types of mental, emotional, and physical activity, body chemistry, and defined areas of the brain, there is no scientific verification that the brain gives rise to consciousness and no viable theory as to how it might do so. Correlation does not equal causality. This simple fact of logic, he says, is overlooked or sidestepped by many neuroscientists and is what David Chalmers, philosopher of mind at NYU, called the hard problem of consciousness. The most that can be said is that science has not yet come up with an objective means of detecting consciousness outside of its neural activity in the physical brain. Federico Fagin is a brilliant Italian physicist and inventor, best known for designing the first commercial microprocessor which launched the digital age in 1971. And he holds 10 other technology patents. He's recently published two leading edge books, uh, one called AI versus Natural Intelligence, and the other more recent one called Silicon from the Microprocessor to the New Science of Consciousness. He has a long and challenging chapter in Consciousness Unbound where he shares some of his gripping, life-changing, mystical experiences in which he became convinced that consciousness could not be modeled by quantitative mathematics, nor could it be a, by a byproduct of biological evolution. He eventually took leave of his work in computer technology in order to elaborate a conceptual framework based on quantum field theory. He calls quantum field theory the most accurate model of reality modern science has and sees it as compatible with the idea that consciousness is ontologically prior to rather than deriving from what we call matter. Fagin postulates its existence as a universal field of potentiality existing even prior to the Big Bang. This primordial reality he calls the one from it, mind and matter, quote, emerge as two co-evolving indivisible principles of the dynamic and holistic substance of the one, unquote. The fundamental purpose of the one in manifestation, he says, is self-realization, an endless unfolding of self-knowing, which gives rise to ever more complex integrated embodiments but which can never be exhausted because of its boundlessness. A theoretical view of the cosmos such as this, he argues, which could be tested, he says, and refined, integrates both the classical model of physics and a physics, he says, well, it's not yet realized by us, but which would encompass the phenomena of reincarnation, lucid dreaming, telepathy, psychokinesis, etc all the psi phenomena. 
students of philosophy will recognize the parallels to what is called pan panentheism. And this is a perspective common to many ancient traditions in which the, the highest deity, the self or consciousness, is both utterly transcendent beyond the coming and going of cosmos and universally eminent in every point of visible and invisible nature. Another brilliant and brave rebel of the mainstream is Christoph Koch, a German-American neurophysiologist and computational neuroscientist, best known for his work on the neural basis of consciousness. He is the chief scientist of the Mind Scope Project, project an arm of the Allen Brain Institute doing the most sophisticated high-tech studies in modern neuroscience. Beginning in 1990, Koch forcefully argued that identifying the mechanistic basis of consciousness was a scientifically solvable problem and wrote over 300 scientific papers and five books on how neurons and computers process information. But around 2010, he began to shift his viewpoint. Quote, I used to be a proponent of the idea of consciousness emerging out of complex neural networks. But over the years, my thinking has changed. Subjectivity is too radically different from anything physical for it to be an emergent phenomenon. This point of view does, not com does come with a metaphysical cost many are unwilling to pay. The admission that experience, the interior perspective of a functioning brain, is something fundamentally different, that it can never be fully reduced physical properties of the brain. I believe that consciousness is a fundamental and elementary property. It can't be derived from anything else. This viewpoint Koch calls panpsychism, a term from the Greek pan meaning all, everything, or the whole, and psyche or psyche meaning soul or mind. It is one of the oldest philosophical theories and has been ascribed to many philosophers, spiritual teachers, and poets, both ancient and modern. It is also Meyer's framework and Jane's as well. Similar to panentheism, it is the idea that consciousness pervades everything. No form of life is without it, and no form can contain the whole of it. In addition, both Human consciousness and nature are composed of a hierarchy of levels, strata, or planes, only a tiny fraction of which may be available to the human conscious mind at any given time. Myers delineates two basic levels, the supraliminal, the conscious, and the subliminal, the vast region of the unconscious, which he also called the more, the transpersonal wellspring of latent human potentials. That which lies at the root of each of us lies at the root of the cosmos too. Kelly points out that in this model, the human brain is seen as a transmitter, similar to the way a radio or a TV functions, as a receiver, filter, or shaper and limiter of consciousness, but not where consciousness originates. Wouldn't it be silly to think that everything we watch on television or on our computer screen or listen to on the radio was generated within the metal box. No, it's not. It is generated, it has its origin elsewhere, and it is only made visible and audible through the TV or radio. A model of this sort would accommodate many of the anomalies of human experience that are otherwise unexplainable. So what about those anomalies? Well, we're gonna go through just a few of them. Genius. Uh, mystical experiences, reincarnation, and near-death experiences. And we'll start with this quote from Emerson. In going down into the secrets of his own mind, he has descended into the secrets of all minds. Nature is the opposite of the soul, answering to it part for part, 
and in fine, the ancient precept, know thyself, and the modern precept, study nature, become at last one maxim. Genius is obviously a topic of enormous human interest and impact, both individually and collectively. Kelly asserts that despite its, quote, crucial importance as an ideal or benchmark and navigational aid for progress in scientific psychology, unquote, its treatment in cognitive science for at least four decades after the time of Myers and James was far from satisfactory or illuminating. And he, uh, uh, Jane, or rather Myers, offered the following psychological definition of genius. Genius, if that vaguely used word is to receive anything like a psychological definition, should rather be regarded as a power of utilizing a wider range than other men can utilize, of faculties in some degree innate in all, a power of appropriating the results of subliminal mentation to subserve the supraliminal, that is the conscious. So it's, it's, it's an accessing of the unconscious to serve the conscious thought so that an quote unquote inspiration of genius will be in truth a subliminal uprush, an emergence into the current of ideas which the man is consciously manipulating of other ideas which he has not consciously originated, but which have shaped themselves beyond his will in profounder regions of his being. I shall urge that there is here no real departure from normality, no abnormality, at least in the sense of degeneration, but rather a fulfillment of the true norm of the man with suggestions, it may be, of something supernormal, of something which transcends existing normality as an advanced stage of evolutionary progress transcends an earlier stage. With genius arises something utterly original, spontaneous, unteachable, and unexpected. For Myers, it must also win for itself the admiration of mankind though the genius of one age may not be recognized until later ages. The rush upward, Myers describes, is akin to a subaqueous spring. Ordinary perceptual and cognitive processes reveal only superficial aspects of, quote, a far wider and deeper range of reality in which we are continually immersed, but which we are not cognizant of. The genius has gained some level of conscious access to these deeper regions of our being and is able to retain what is found there. But not everything that emerges from the subliminal is of the same value or of the same level of reality. And Myers distinguishes these three uh, strata of subliminal consciousness. The first being related to physiological centers and mechanical effects due to habit uh, stimulus inputs that escape conscious detection. And these are going on all the time for us. The second is what he called the hypnotic stratum associated with daydreaming, ordinary dreaming and fantasy. What he called, quote, an incessant manufacture of inward romances, unquote. <laughs> uh, that is that they're still held, uh, they're colored and captive by personal desires, ambitions and motives. The third level is what he called the locus of supernormal contact with the subliminal. And he divides this into two parts. The lesser pertaining to lower psi phenomena in which there is still a more or less indiscriminate, uncontrolled or instable permeability, he calls it, uh, of the conscious mind to the subliminal. And this can result in forms of mediumship, which are again occurring all the time for most people, but which we don't have the faculties to recognize. We don't have the attentive uh, tools. Um, and uh, it, those who are mentally passive or disturbed, this instable permeability uh, helps to explain, as he did, uh, various aspects of mental disorders and hysteria, and often uh, is also associated with uh, substance abuse and other addictions. 
He said, quote, hidden deep in our being is both a rubbish heap and a treasure house. Such lower level transmissions are often highly subjective, sectarian or pathological, destructive to humane ends, and tend to exhaust and deplete the experiencer. Uh, and this leads to a dissolutive process as opposed to an evolutive process. The real gold mine of the subliminal lies in what Myers calls, quote, the transpersonal strata, where in are derived the intuitions and inspirations of genius, in which the individuality comes closest to a full and harmonious manifestation of its higher capabilities. And in many wisdom traditions, uh, we find this kind of mapping out of the strata of consciousness has been done. For, uh, you know, this is ancient traditions. It's long, long been known and, and uh, distinguished in, in much more revealing ways, actually, than what Myers outlines. And so the, the transpersonal level of genius that he was referring to would likely occur in the Platonic tradition with what is called nous, in Raja Yoga with, with what is called the Karan Upadi, a causal vesture or vehicle. Upadi means um, uh, a vehicle or instrument through which consciousness is acting at a certain level. And then in Vedanta would be, would be Vigyanamaya Kosha, Kosha meaning a sheath, again, it's very similar to Upadi, Vigyana meaning consciousness, and Anandamaya Kosha, Ananda meaning bliss. So there's this element of blissfulness that occurs when these uh, deeper subliminal uh, regions are activated. And in Buddhism, uh, the term manas is used in reference to human consciousness. And depending on the school, we we're, we're often see these three main levels, which are not identical to Myers, but are nonetheless very helpful in describing what Myers was talking about. The lower level being the coarse mind, which is still captive to what are called the poisons uh, and the, uh, the vestures, the lower vestures, to, to ignorance, grasping, egotism, and, and thus giving rise to disharmony and, huff and suffering. That's the lowest level of the mind. And then there's the subtle level or the higher level of the mind, which is in Buddhism referred to as Elaya Vijnana, a storehouse of consciousness. But it also has, um, in certain levels, a still an element of ahankara, that is of, of egotism, uh, of separate, being a separate ray. Even though it's an immortal ray, it's still distinguished. The highest being the clear light of pristine awareness, the Buddha nature, which is free of its non-dual and omniscient, free of all dualities. And in the Pythagorean and Kabbalistic system, there is a tenfold stratification also, which we're not gonna go into detail, but just to note that these, are, these traditions exist. Skilled and persistent effort is almost invariably necessary, both to initiate and shape the subliminal work, said Myers. And then we added this quote from Edison, genius is 1% inspiration and 99% perspiration. We're not sure if Myers would agree with the percentages, but it's a similar point. In 1926, a descriptive model of the processes typically involved in genius level creativity was given an explicit formulation by the distinguished French mathematician, Jacques Hadamard, and later restated more explicitly by Graham Wallace in 1926 and Elliot Dole Hutchinson in 1931. Hadamard and Wallace started with an introspective analysis of their own mental processes but also studied hundreds of accounts by scientists and mathematicians, artists, musicians, and writers. The model involves four stages, which do not always occur in a simple or uh, linear or sequential fashion. Preparation, incubation, illumination, and verification. The preparation stage, which uh, you're probably all familiar more or less with what is being spoken of here, but it's that initial intense voluntary effort that's needed on a particular work or problem. 
And this can include the lengthy periods of time in which high level technical skills relevant to the task are acquired. If this initial effort fails, the work or problem may be temporarily set aside in frustration. And this results in an incubation period in which conscious effort seems to be largely absent. But there is something more than simple rest going on, for it is followed by illumination, inspiration, or insight in which radically new ideas intrude into consciousness, often suddenly, copiously, and with strong accompanying affect. This leads to a further stage of voluntary effort called verification, in which new material may be evaluated, elaborated, and worked into the structure of the evolving product. Audemard himself made major contributions to number theory, complex analysis, differential geometry, and differential equations. He studied and documented not only his own experience with mathematical discoveries, but also those of over 100 leading mathematicians and scientists, including Einstein. In his short book, Psychology of Invention in the Mathematical Field, which if you Google, Google that, you'll find it online, he found that there cannot be any doubt as to the existence of complex problem solving, which goes on subconsciously and often in connection with sleep states. Strictly speaking, he says, there is hardly any completely logical discovery. This is remarkable for a mathematician to be saying, right? You think it's all logic. Uh, some intervention or intuition issuing from the unconscious is necessary at least to initiate the logical work. So advanced are some of these spontaneously arising and paradoxical intuitions, he noted, that sometimes decades must pass and whole new realms of mathematics must be invented simply to prove or explain their validity. On more than one occasion, he himself experienced the phenomena where at the moment of awakening from sleep, a solution long searched for by him appeared to him without a moment's conscious reflection on his part and frequently in, quote, quite a different direction from any of those which he had been previously been trying to follow. Many other documented cases of key scientific breakthroughs occurring in a similar manner are well known. By his own accounts, Einstein's theories of both general and special relativity arrived in flashes of insight. Both were ultimately derived from his imaginative thought experiment generated at age 16, observing a beam of light while traveling at the speed of light. The insights he finally intuited could not be reconciled with current theories or equations, and additional years of effort were needed to prove them mathematically. Dmitry Mendeleev was a Russian chemist and inventor who testified that his greatest breakthrough, the periodic table of elements arranged according to atomic weight, came to him in a dream. Uh, and there was only one that needed to be corrected afterwards while he was, uh, the next day when he was looking at it. Likewise, uh, August Kekul a, was a German chemist who wrote of a daydream in which hydrogen atoms spontaneously ordered themselves into a hexagon, encircled by the image of a snake biting its own tail. This was the first mapping of a molecular structure, which also completely revolutionized the field of organic chemistry. A most extraordinary and well-documented case is that of Srinivas Ramanujan, the modern mathematical genius who credited his many mathematical insights to the goddess Namagiri, a form of Lakshmi who appeared to him in dreams and visions. This largely self-taught prodigy managed not only to recapitulate a sizable portion of Western mathematics by the age of 16, but in the 15 years following to generate 3,900 never before seen number theorems. Only a few of them turned out to be incorrect. Discovered in 1913 by the distinguished British mathematician G.H. Harding, Ramanujan continued this prolific outpouring 
up until his untimely death at the age of 33. He would have dreams where there would be scrolls of mathematics theorems un <laughs> unrolled before him, and he would spontaneously recognize them as being true. And when he woke up, he would write them down. But he, didn't, he didn't, uh, couldn't do the proofs, didn't know how to do the proofs until he met Hardy, and Hardy trained him to start uh, uh, developing the proofs for them. But he also had a remarkable, um, what um, Myers called, uh, it's like a spontaneous knowledge, automatisms, that was the term he used, where he would like instantly see the answers to very complex numeric problems and make many associ numeric associations. His, uh, some of his most important theorems have already taken decades to prove by other mathematicians and have led to other important advances in areas as diverse as cancer research and black holes. All the main ingredients of Meyer's theory of genius are present in Ramanujan. <clears throat> including that, as we've already mentioned, as uh, memory, automatisms, and mysticism. Ramanujan once said that an equation for me has no meaning unless it expresses a thought of God. And uh, Robert Conigal made this remarkable statement that um, each new theorem was one more piece of the infinite unfathomed. So we're going to take a three to five minute break that we stretched a little bit and then we'll start again on genius and inspiration. That's the next part. Oh, ra rather, sorry, genius and imagination. It's not time to clap yet. <laughs> Well, these, you know, I mean, this, I mean, I've been. It's such a big deal. I mean, it is. One of it's the most important topics on the planet right now. Right. You blew out the gates. Yeah. And uh, there's a whole computational model right. that's not making sense to a lot of people. And yet we've all assumed it's so. Right. And it, it's, you know, everybody just assumed in advance it has to be a mechanical, neurochemical thing. Yeah. And so because they, that becomes this obstacle. Because it just sounds, it's, it just sounds too fantastic from ordinary materialistic messages that it could be something else. It just something yeah. that's just yeah. Yeah. So, so you know, once you start to get into mysticism, yeah. it's just like yeah. just whole other level. And and there's there's um, a, a talk you would really enjoy. It's called uh, "It from Bit from Chip." It's this. Uh, Vedanta Swami from New York, or he's not from New York, he's from India, but he's the, the I think he's the president now of the U.S. Vedanta Society. Um, Sar Sarvri, um, 
Paranunda, something like that. You have, it's not ringing a bell? No, but I live in a hole. I live and breathe great groups. God, this guy's brilliant. Really yeah. brilliant. And he's, he, he takes, I just saw it last night. I hadn't seen the, uh, his, this particular talk of his, which he just gave three weeks ago. But it's like, same theme. He's talking about how modern science, and, and he's uh, a particular book by Holt that he's recommending that everyone reads, where this guy went around and he asked all these most brilliant people he could find, both in, in religion and science, these fundamental questions about the nature of consciousness and mind and the universe. And he collected it into this book and, and apparently wove it together in a really magnificent way. And, and so the Swami is saying, everybody should read this. But then he, so he gives that perspective and he, he talks about how modern science is just edging into this, you know, resistantly edging into this whole new revolutionary uh, domain. But he says, of course, Vedanta has been teaching this yeah, <laughs> a long <of> course time. <laughs> <laughs> and goes way beyond, you know. So then he ends with this, uh, these three short quotes from the, the Gita, and it's beautiful. He speaks in it's New York. from Git, from Chit. Yeah, okay. <laughs> uh, we wrap it yeah. up. Yeah. Okay, folks, we're going to get started again. Let's all get in our seats. We're going to get started again. So there will probably only be 10 minutes or so for questions at the end, uh, discussion, but if people want to stay longer, I'm happy to stay longer. So genius and imagination. Views similar to Meyer's were also characteristic of 18th century romantic poets and the transcendentalists such as Emerson and Thoreau. Myers specifically called on Woods, Wordsworth and Coleridge to help him define the faculty of imagination. Samuel Taylor Coleridge was a writer and theologian who recognized that the early poems of his friend Wordsworth were markedly superior to his own. Darn it. In seeking to understand why, he turned first to the mainstream psychology of his day, which was dominated by Hobbes, Locke, Hume, and Hartley who were extending the triumphs of classical mechanistic physics into the domain of the mind. Imagination in this framework was to be conceived in terms of novel combinations or recombinations of inde independent bits or parts somehow stored in the brain. And, and Kelly says that this is more or less the view that still predominates today that those, those bits or parts are there, they get recombinated by this you know, magnificent neural network, and then out comes you know, imaginative genius. Uh, but for Coleridge, that didn't, it didn't make sense. It didn't, was not sufficient of uh, an explanation. And um, he, uh, in, in relation to what he could directly observe in creative geniuses, such as Wordsworth, Shakespeare, Milton, and himself, among others. Imagination as it operates in men of genius, Coleridge wrote, is, quote, a living power and prime agent of all human perceptions, a synthetic and magical capacity, organic and active, which assimilates, dissolves, and recreates, synthesizes, and unifies. At its pinnacle, he deemed it a participation in the creative action of eternity itself. The primary imagination I hold to be a repetition in the finite mind of the eternal act of creation in the infinite I am. This definition is allied, Kelly points out, with the classical Greek idea of fantasia, which is now reduced to the idea of fantasy, a kind of escapist daydreaming with little or no cognitive import. In a neoplatonic context, however, it would be instead related to what is called dianoia, creative ideation, 
based on archetypal principles that are logoic and cosmogonic, a perception of and bringing into manifestation of that which is hidden in the vaster regions of our being, a kind of participation in the ontology of the cosmos itself. For Myers, the outreach toward what he called the transpersonal subliminal is not purely intellectual, but telesthetic is a term he used, a form of extrasensory perception motivated by affective factors, in particular by a sense of beauty. Myers draws directly from Plato's symposium for his conception of love, which he considered the foundation of both genius and religion. Love draws genius forward from beautiful objects to beautiful ideas and ultimately to the archetype and formless essence of beauty itself. As Plato states, beholding beauty with the eye of the mind, he will be enabled to bring forth not images of beauty, but realities, unquote. For Myers, as for Plato, love, beauty, and truth ultimately merge in exalted states of consciousness. All this helps us to understand why Myers selects as his penultimate example of genius what he calls the completest type of humanity, the Alexandrian mystical philosopher Plotinus. Genius and mysticism. Psychology must take account of the full range of human experience or be reduced to a caricature, a defacing of what it means to be human. Kelly recounts how decades passed in which the scientific literature of modern psychology refused to acknowledge or grapple with the vast literature and firsthand accounts of mystical experiences. As Myers asserts here, what has been despised or avoided needs instead to be placed at the forefront while also avoiding the controversies that often arise in relation to conflicting theological dogmas or belief systems. At the heart of the largest controversy, as we've already mentioned, is that between the physicalist or materialist science, what we called scientism, that a priori denies that such experiences are valid and the large body of evidence and long history of mysticism in which such life-changing and consciousness-altering experiences hold a central role. An attempt is made to traverse the enormous world literature drawing from many different traditions to demonstrate the commonalities and consistencies across cultures and historical epochs. Quote, our plan is to pursue a middle course, close in empirical spirit to the approaches of F.W.H. Myers and William James, which takes the phenomena of mysticism seriously, but soberly attempts to draw out their significant implications for contemporary theories of personality and cognition. For Kelly, William James's varieties of religious experience remains the natural starting point, even after 100 years, he says. James emphasized the central importance of mystical states to the entire subject matter of his book, quote, the vital chapter from which the other chapters get their light, unquote. Churches, theologies, and institutions are important as vehicles for passing on insights gained by mystical experience, but in James's view, they are second hand to the experience itself in the private breast, quote unquote. The mystic is often seen as heretical, in fact, by the institution, but later sets the pattern of aspiration for others. Mystical states are identified by James as having four principal marks. The first, ineffability, it defies expression. No adequate report of it can be given in words, that's part of the problem. 
it follows from this that its quality must be directly experienced. It cannot be imparted or transferred to others, unquote. The beauty of a spectacular sunset cannot be adequately conveyed to one who has never seen one, even for geniuses of language like Wordsworth or Rumi. The second is noetic quality. Uh, mystical states are both states of feeling and of knowledge. They offer insight into depths of truth unplumbed by the discursive intellect. They are intimations, revelations, full of significance and importance. Quote, subjects feel sure that they have been granted a fundamental insight into the nature of reality. Transience, usually, though not always, they can be sustained only for short periods, ranging from a few seconds to a few hours, sometimes reoccurring over time with progressive development. And there's a sense of non-agency. Um, and James uses the word passivity, but it, I think that's the connotation is not that one has made no effort, but rather that even in the cases where it's been cultivated through meditation, there's a sense of it coming from the outside, of, of it overwhelming and overtaking <coughs> the individual as being almost as, as uh, like, like the ocean uh, would overtake one when one is immersed. Walt Whitman, according to James, seemed to be a regular visitor to such regions. And this is a quote from his uh, book, Specimen, Days, and Collect. There is a part from mere intellect in the makeup of every superior human identity, a wondrous something that realizes without argument, frequently without what is called education, although I think it a, the goal and apex of all education deserving the name, an intuition of the absolute balance in time and space of the whole of this multifariousness, this revel of fools and incredible make-believe and general unsettledness we call the world. A sole sight of that divine clue and unseen thread which holds the whole conjuries of things all history and time and all events, however trivial, however momentous, like a leashed dog in the hand of the hunter. Of such soul sight and root center for the mind, mere optimism explains only the surface. In regard to the near unanimity uh, at the core of mysticism's, mysticism, James wrote, this overcoming of all the usual barriers between the individual and the absolute is the great mystic achievement. In mystic states, we both become one with the absolute and we become aware of our oneness. This is the everlasting and triumphant mystical tradition, hardly altered by differences of clime or creed, in Hinduism, in Neoplatonism, in Sufism, in Christian mysticism, in Whitmanism, we find the same reoccurring note. So that there is about mystical utterances an eternal unanimity which ought to make a critic stop and think and which brings it about that the mystical classics have, as has been said, neither birthday nor native land perpetually telling of the unity of man with God. Their speech antedates languages, and they do not grow old. That art thou, say the Upanishads. In the vision of God, says Plotinus, what sees is not our reason, but something prior and superior to our reason. He who thus sees does not properly see, does not distinguish or imagine two things. He changes. He ceases to be himself, preserves nothing of himself. Absorbed in God, he makes one with him, like a center of a circle 
coinciding with another center. James quotes the Canadian psychiatrist Richard M. Buck, uh, who lived uh, 1837 to 1902, and who at the age of 35 had a single and brief experience of what he called cosmic consciousness. And I think he was the one who coined the term, actually, uh, and which led him to devote the remainder of his life to investigating and reporting it in others. In 1872, after an evening of stimulating conversation with his friend Walt Whitman in the countryside, Buck was traveling back to London in a buggy and he uh, conveys the experience in this way. I had spent the evening in a great city with two friends reading and discussing poetry and philosophy. We parted at midnight. I had a long drive to my lodging my mind deeply under the influence of the ideas, images, and emotions called up by the reading and talk was calm and peaceful. I was in a state of quiet, almost passive enjoyment, not actually thinking but letting ideas, images, and emotions flow of themselves as it were through my mind. All at once, without warning of any kind, I find myself, found myself wrapped in a flame-colored cloud. For an instant I thought of fire, an immense conflagration somewhere close by in that great city. The next, I knew that the fire was within myself. Directly afterward, there came upon me a sense of exaltation, of immense joyous accompany, uh, sorry, immense joyousness accompanied or immediately followed by an intellectual illumination impossible to describe. Among other things, I did not merely come to believe, but I saw that the universe is not composed of dead matter, but is, on the contrary, a living presence. I became conscious in myself of eternal life. It was not a conviction that I would have, that I would have eternal life, but a consciousness that I possessed eternal life then. I saw that all men are immortal, that the cosmic order is such that without any per adventure, all things work together for the good of each and all, that the foundation principle of the world, of all the worlds, is what we call love, and that the happiness of each and all is, in the long run, absolutely certain. The vision lasted a few seconds and was gone, but the memory of it and the sense of the reality of what it taught has remained during the quarter of a century which has since elapsed. I knew that what the vision showed was true. I had attained to a point of view from which I saw that it must be true. That view, that conviction, that I may say, I may say that consciousness has never, even during the periods of the deepest depression, been lost. And this description is very similar to the one Fajin gives in his, um, in his book, In Consciousness Unbound, almost identical in some ways. James next goes on using the relatively small number of texts and accounts available to him at that time to provide a sampling of documented reports of higher states methodically cultivated by Hindu, Buddhist, Sufi, and Christian mystical traditions. He views the physical, mental, and moral discipline undertaken to cultivate them as differing, quote, only slightly in the different traditions which teach it, unquote. However, most of James, James's focus is on the Christian mystics, St. John of the Cross, St. Francis, and Dionysius, among others. Kelly detects an undercurrent of bias in both James and Myers too ready to exalt Christianity at the expense of other religions and to presume that pre-literate, quote unquote, people are incapable of such knowledge. Frank Cushing in his Folk Tales of the Zuni and scholar Joseph Epes Brown in his 1991 book, The Sacred Pipe, 
defend core elements of Native American traditions, while Mircea Iliad found examples among the shamans of Siberia. These and many others have since affirmed that legitimate and unique expressions of perennial wisdom as uh, developed and experienced in mystical states are present in such cultures. Myers and James both acknowledged that in India, training in higher states of consciousness has been known from time immemorial under the name of yoga. Yoga means the experiential union of the individual with the divine, the drop with the ocean. In Hindu philosophy, the jivatma with paramatma. An enormous body of theoretical and practical information pertaining to yoga was collected, systematized, and crystallized in the form of 196 aphorisms by Patanjali. And we had a presentation here at the Institute about five months ago on this text. Central to Patanjali's practical psychology and demanding discipline is the training of introspective attention. This is the key that James recognized as a crucial technology in the science of the mind, without which the deeper levels of perception and reality remain inaccessible. In Patanjali, once a proper ethical foundation has been established, the threefold practice of sanyama, uh, systematically intensified, leads through a hierarchy of increasingly exalted states and culminates in this unbroken awareness of pure limitless consciousness. A byproduct of the practice is the development of supernormal capacities, which are called cities. And Kelly kind of bemoans the fact, but recognizes that in Patanjali, he specifically states that these are not really to be focused on. Uh, he would like to see those uh, you know, practiced yogis, you know, be brought into the lab so that he could test their <laughs> supernormal <laughs> capacities, but it would, even according to Patanjali, would undermine the process. The stages of dhyana described in the earliest Buddhist sutras are similar to those described by Patanjali. In Mahayana and Vajrayana texts, the higher levels of arupa or formless dhyana, as realized by the bodhisattva, are described in bewildering detail. Rather than seeking individual enlightenment, however, the overarching aim is the culmination of altruism, in which the yogi becomes capable of ceaselessly watching over, serving and aiding the evolution of humanity and the whole of visible and invisible nature. This aligns with a somewhat neglected strain found in the Bhagavad Gita and the experience of many mystics, as well as of Buck, as we've already quoted, that the highest purified consciousness is inherently sacrificial and salvific, the outpouring of boundless love, fused of universal wisdom, known as the Buddha nature. Besides Myers, James, and Burke, um, the, uh, Kelly includes numerous, or Buck rather, uh, Kelly includes numerous other authors who provide a modern cataloging of cross-cultural and cross-temporal mysticism, such as Stace, this uh, small text called The Teachings of the Mystics, which is, I'd recommend to anyone, it's a really beautiful collection from many different traditions. Happold, Underhill, and Woods, and among many others. A more contemporary survey of mystics who were also spiritual forerunners or prolific philosophers, which Kelly admits he is not, he's not a philosopher himself, uh, can be found in the works of Elton Hall. And for reader, readers interested in the many dimensions of cross-cultural mystical symbolism. There are two texts, two volumes available now by Helen Valberg. And for those searching for an in-depth exploration of the metaphysics at the root of the mystic tradition, we could not fail to mention two books by H.P. Blavatsky, The Secret Doctrine and The Key to Theosophy. 
And uh, she was writing, of course, more than a decade before Myers and James, and she set down in much greater detail the outline uh, uh, of this perennial wisdom that they uh, also sketch. And Raghavan Iyer's The Gupta Vidya is a continuation of Blavatsky's work, which also offers profound insights into current day ethical and metapsychological dimensions of the spiritual path. The summarizing point that Kelly makes on this theme is one that Blavatsky and Iyer would concur with. There are inescapable interconnections, both historical and psychological, between mysticism, creativity, and genius. Historically, it is a brute fact that they co-occur to a conspicuous degree. Not only are mystical states characteristic of most known spiritual, literary, and philosophic luminaries, but similar patterns are known to exist among artists, physicians, and scientists. In 1949, Einstein wrote, I maintain that cosmic religious feeling is the strongest and boldest incitement to scientific research. The tradition linking music with mysticism in the West goes back at least as far as Pythagoras, and a list of the most widely revered Western composers subject to mystical type experiences would almost certainly include, Kelly says, not only Bach, Mozart, and Beethoven, but numerous others, including the jazz artist John Coltrane. It is then no exaggeration, Kelly writes, to say with Bach that mystical consciousness pervades the foundations of civilization. The correlation is less than perfect, to be sure, for there have been geniuses who are not recognizable mystics and vice versa. Nevertheless, we predict with confidence, as Myers would, that if one administered standardized instruments for measurement of creativity and mysticism to a sufficiently large number of, of subjects, one would find a significant overrepresentation of persons scoring extremely high on both dimensions simultaneously. So we'll be passing out uh, exams at the end of the talk. <laughs> on the subject of reincarnation, Kelly refers extensively to the work of Dr. Ian P. Stevenson a Canadian-born American psychiatrist who was the founder of the Division of Perceptual Studies at the University of Virginia School of Medicine in 1967, and also founded the Society for Scientific Exploration of the Mind in 1982. His professional career was devoted to the study of phenomena suggestive of reincarnation, about which he wrote over 300 scientific papers and 14 books. His particularly he particularly studied cases of young children who had spontaneous but credible past life memories, and he traveled all over the world to document and investigate them. He knew of over 10,000 cases, but only consented to do research on 2,500. Of those, 1,200 were considered solved, meaning that all reasonable possibility of fraud had been arguably eliminated and that positive factual knowledge of what appeared to be the child's previous life had been independently verified. In general, cases would involve children two to five years of age who from the time they are just learning to speak claim they belong to a different family. They recount specific memories such as the town where they lived, the names of their family members or friends and other factual recollections and details that could be potentially verified. Stevenson would begin by interviewing such children and then proceed to interview the family and associates of the alleged previous lifetime. His team would undertake painstaking research of historical documents, news archives, as well as police and medical records connected with the former life. There were also many instances of what he called biological memory, where birthmarks on the child's body corresponded with documented injuries sustained in the previous life. There's one case where um, the child had a 
uh, a, a large birthmark in the throat or near the throat. <coughs> and when they went and uh, did the investigation, they found that the previous lifetime was, was claimed. There was a, it was a suicide in which uh, the, the person had shot themselves in the throat. And he, <coughs> he, Stevenson said, well, then if that was the case and you were holding the gun here, there should be another mark on the back of your head. So they cut his hair and sure enough, they found, they found a birthmark there. Stevenson was concerned to establish his, his research on a rigorous basis that could be accepted by the scientific community. He was also very careful about the conclusions he drew. He never claimed that the evidence amounted to proof of reincarnation. However, he did say that the only other credible explanation would be a very remarkable form of clairvoyance or telepathy. And if we prefer this latter explanation, then we're still talking about capacities of consciousness that cannot be explained by uh, modern theories of the mind. Most of Stevenson's writing is very dry and factual, like a medical journal. However, this last book he wrote before his death in 2007, uh, Children Who Remember Previous Lives, is aimed at the general public, and we heartily recommend it to anyone interested in an introduction to the topic. One of the points he makes in the opening chapter is that many Westerners mistakenly believe that the acceptance of reincarnation is restricted to populations of Southeast Asia, to Hindus, Buddhists, Jains, and Sikhs. This is not the case, he says. Inhabitants of many other parts of the world currently also believe in reincarnation. He mentions the Shiite Muslims of Western Asia, as well as the Sufis, the inhabitants of West and East Africa who have been formally but incompletely uh, indoctrinated to, uh, into Islam and Christianity. Large minorities in Brazil, substantial numbers of First Nation tribes of Northwestern North America, Inuit tribes of Northern Canada, and other indigenous tribal peoples of Trobiand Island, Central Australia, and Northern Japan. In 2007, Stevenson cited surveys showing that 28% of adults in Britain, France, and the US believe or did believe in reincarnation. And a more recent Pew survey that we just saw a few days ago from 2021 shows that it's now 33% of all adults in the US and Europe of whatever belief system uh, or none also believe in reincarnation. And Reincarnation has a long history in Western culture and was possibly taught in the mystery schools of Egypt and Greece, even prior to Pythagoras and Plato, who both taught it. Uh, and some scholars of comparative religion also point out that there are passages in the Talmud, the Quran, and the Bible, which suggest reincarnation was originally part of these ancient Western traditions as well. Uh, of course, just because a lot of people believe in something and have done so in many cultures and climes doesn't make it true. And that is why Stevenson set out to see if an empirical basis could be established. So we just like to briefly sketch a single case uh, that was investigated by Dr. James Tucker, who was continuing the work of Stevenson at the University of Virginia. And it is that of James Lineager uh, whose story was captured in film documentaries on ABC and Fox. And if you Google his name, you'll find it. It's a really nice little short 20 minute, 30 minute uh, documentaries. Really remarkable because they, they're filming him when, at a very young age when he was having his first recollections. Uh, James was born to a Protestant couple in Louisiana and is a young adult now, but even at the age of two, was obsessed with airplanes and aircraft of all kinds and seems to have come into life with an innate knowledge of many details about them. Besides his parents' own testimony, the family has preserved video footage of him as a toddler where upon visiting aircraft museums or air shows, this two-year-old would begin performing pre-checks on the planes <laughs> as though he were a pilot about to board. 
and it was also around the age of two that James began having horrific nightmares of being in a plane crash. He spoke of having been a pilot, that he had thrown off a, uh, flown, <laughs> flown off of a boat, and that his plane had been shot down. He named the boat, the Natoma, named the type of aircraft that he flew in, a course air, and also named other pilots who were stationed on the same boat. And he would have these, started having these dreams every night, which of course would wake him up for, from sleep and very disruptive. You know, his parents had, you know, felt they had to do something. And from uh, an aerial photograph, he apparently identified Iwo Jima as the location of the crash. And when questioned by his mom, you know, who shot him down, he said, well, obviously it was the Japanese. Yeah. And uh, his father did not believe in reincarnation at all, but he was the one, and he was not an aviator, had no connection with the military at all, but he began doing research and found that indeed there was an aircraft carrier called the USS Natoma Bay that was stationed in the Pacific during World War II and that there was only one plane that, that was shot down at Iwo Jima, which had flown off of the Natoma. Years later, he also found out the, the pilot who had flown that plane was James Houston II. And the plane had crashed exactly the way his, his son had been describing. James Lineager, as a two-year-old, had been signing his drawings of plane battles as James III. Having discovered James II, the Lineagers then contacted James Houston's sister, who was still alive. When she and the young James III met, uh, James III asked this elderly woman for a picture that their mother had drawn of her <laughs> when they were children. And the woman was startled because there's no one but the nuclear family could have known that such was the case. And there was actually two drawings that their mother had done, which had been stored in the attic for 50 years, which she then went and retrieved and, and, and sent it to James, James III. Another book, not mentioned by Kelly, but which we would highly recommend to anyone who's also interested in the Tibetan Buddhist tradition, is one by Tenzin Gyatso, the 14th Dalai Lama. It's an autobiography published in 1962 and the first book in English written by him. It is the only book that I know of where you're given a description of the, of the systematic process by which a reincarnating Lama is identified. And uh, it's, uh, it's remarkable. Um, and I won't go into the detail here, but again, it's an indication that there are these ancient traditions where there was an understanding of reincarnation and also how to identify re you know, reincarnated persons. Companion to the reincarnation research is that involving near-death experiences or NDEs made widely known through the writings of Dr. Raymond Moody, the forensic psychologist who first coined the term in 1975. After having had an NDE himself and subsequently interviewing many dozens of patients that endured them, he found that there are common features Number one, there's no dreaded judgment day, but instead an exceedingly rapid, radically clear, and unbiased moral appraisal, appraisal of the life just lived in vivid detail. So it's like the whole scope of the life is, is seen in, you know, in, in, in a few moments. Number two, individuals lost or they lose their fear of death because they become convinced that consciousness continues beyond the death of the body. Number three, they understood by this experience the reason they were incarnating on earth was to learn how to become more compassionate. So you see these tremendous psychological changes that occur when people have these experiences. There's also often a perception of the entire event, the dying body and surrounding environment, 
as from a distance. Such perceptions often occur in very stable and serene states of consciousness without any anxiety or fear and seem far more real, vibrant, with clarifying understanding and exceedingly vast in their scope than the state of mind that they uh, inhabited either before the event or when they return to the body, the, the state of mind that it occurs after. So it's very distinctly different from the normal waste waking consciousness. And this was found to be true even in cases where near death uh, happened, in, happened suddenly, like in the case of a car crash or some horrible accident. Again, la, la, no fear, consciousness serene and stable, viewing the whole event, no pain, just observing. And, and the just, uh, just exceedingly sense of you know, freedom, of, of not being bounded any longer. It's just, oh, thank goodness I'm out of that body. <laughs> yeah. There's a, also a remarkable subset of the NDE case studies that have been taken up by Dr. Kenneth Ring, uh, in which individuals were born blind, blind. Many blind individuals have reported seeing for the first time during their NDE. And this clearly points to a form of consciousness that's not dependent on the physical vesture for its capacities. Moody's work was initially rejected by the scientific community, but now several decades, decades later, we're finding it has been rescued from the trash bin of pseudoscience and has entered medical mainstream. Just seven months ago, a global multidisciplinary team of medical professionals, surgeons, and researchers led by Sam Parnia, MD, PhD, published guidelines and standards for the study of death and recalled experiences of death. And you can Google, Google this and, and find it, uh, the study online. A consensus statement and proposed future directions for the annals of the New York Academy of Sciences. Among their conclusions are the following. Because of advances in, me in medical science, surgery and resuscitation procedures, that is they even have forms of surgery now where they can put the whole body and brain into a, like a, a comatose state and, and refrigerated state so that they can do an operation and then revive it. <clears throat> Many people numbering in the hundreds of millions have now survived documented encounters with death or near death. These people have consistently described recalled experiences which involve a, a unique sent, a set of mental recollections with universal themes, very much like uh, uh, Woody was describing. Contrary to conclusions drawn by other smaller scale studies, these recollections are not consistent with those induced by oxygen deprivation, hallucinations, or psychedelic drug-induced states. Instead, they follow a specific narrative involving lucidity and heightened states of consciousness, even while the body and brain have passed beyond the point of clinical death, resulting in positive long-term psychological transformations and growth. And uh, we've missed their conference. They already had one this year, but uh, the International Association for Near-Death Studies meets every year. It's a, it's a large organization, many members, and uh, they have some remarkable online um, talks given by uh, reputable folks. And uh, those, yeah, we recommend taking a peek at those as well. As a way of concluding, I am just going to describe one NDE that, which is quite extraordinary and encompasses many of the themes we have looked at already and, and a few more that we haven't. Um, be, because it occurred in a hospital setting under a doctor's care and with the latest monitoring equipment, the actual uh, medical condition of the patient is recorded and can be independently verified. And it's the story of Anita Morjani, whose book, Dying to Be Me, was published in March of 2012. 
and there's a film being made about it uh, as we speak, apparently. Anita was born to Indian parents and raised in Hong Kong with a British education. In the spring of 20, uh, 2002, in her late 20s, she was diagnosed with an early stage of cancer and immediately began seeking a variety of alternative therapies. Nonetheless, her disease progressed and by 2006, the cancer had spread, creating tumors the size of lemons in her entire lymphatic system, starting in her throat, back, chest, lungs, and abdomen. She was unable to digest food and too weak to walk. Open lesions began uh, appearing on her skin and on February 2nd of 2006, she was admitted to the hospital ICU near her home in Hong Kong. As major internal organs began to shut down and Nita entered a comatose state, it quickly became evident to the attending doctors that she had mere hours to live. Her family was notified. That afternoon, Anita went through a remarkable new death experience. Upon entering the coma, Anita recounts a fully conscious process where she became increasingly detached from and insensitive to her physical body and personal emotions. At the same time, deep feelings of complete well-being, freedom, contentment, and ease were welling up. This was in sharp contrast to the many months of suffering, exhaustion, and emotional turmoil she had just been through. All pains, aches, longings, and sorrows were disappearing. Meanwhile, the sharpness of her perception, knowledge, and understanding grew increasingly intense and expansive. She not only saw and understood every detail of what was going on immediately around her physical body, but also at a distance. She describes seeing, hearing, and understanding what the doctors were discussing regarding her medical condition 40 feet down the hall. She also describes seeing and knowing her brother was boarding a plane thousands of miles away in India in order to be by her side. She saw her own body and her husband by her side. She slowly realized she could be aware of and witness anything simply by placing her attention there. She even understood other people's thoughts and feelings as though they were her own. The more detached from her physical condition, the more she became aware of a much larger picture. Her awareness and sense of being continued to expand and quote, fill every space, unquote, until there was no separation between her and everything else. In her own words, she, quote, became everything and everyone, unquote. At the same time, she reports seeing or knowing that all events of whatever kind were unfolding in a perfectly interwoven tapestry and that everything was as it should be. The more consciousness expanded, she says, the less miraculous it felt. It was as though this euphoric, unbounded sense of being and karmic justice were the natural condition as opposed to the prison house of attachments, worries, dogma, and belief she had been inhabiting. Though she repeatedly admits that words cannot properly describe it, her primary experience was a condition she calls, quote, eternal, unbounded, and unconditional love. Above, below, and all around, pervading everything and excluding nothing, was a superb and glorious love joy, ecstasy, and awe, completely engulfing her. It was not a love that needed to be earned or deserved, but was her very being, she says, her true nature and something inherent in the essence of all things. Nothing was outside it, apart from it, or separated from it. Time, she says, also felt different in that realm. Past, present, and future blended. Past lives, the current life, future outcomes, and future lives were not in linear succession as we think they would, must be. 
but were occurring and being perceived simultaneously. Though to speak and write of the experience afterwards created confusion, she says, while in that state, there was none. Instead, there was complete clarity and understanding, a unifying sense of the perfect fitness of all things and the infinite unbroken web of interconnected life. For the first time, she says, the universe <laughs> made sense. <laughs> yeah. For the first time, she saw her purpose in life, the reason why she had cancer, and, exa and exactly what had brought her to this turning point. She understood she was dying from her own fears. She saw that her cancer was not a karmic punishment, but the natural consequence of a long series of choices she had made which harshly thwarted, diverted, and devalued her deepest inspirations, her inner nature, and her true calling. This had not only affected her physically in this dramatic way, but every living thing around her and the quality of embodied life itself. So it's this uh, yeah, non-dualist view. There was no shame or guilt in this realization, but only clarity. And as she reveled in this newfound understanding, she also became aware that she had a specific choice to make. She could either go back to her body or to pass through the final blissful, or semi-final, blissful doors of death into what we call death, but which involved the freedom of consciousness, not the termination of it. She could also see with complete certainty that if she returned to the physical life with her newfound, joyous, boundless definition of self and its connection with all that is, that her body would heal quickly. She saw that there was a purpose, duty, or dharma yet for her to fulfill, one that she would not have to search for, but would, which, if she allowed it, would, uh, would unfold naturally. Of course, it involved helping lots of people, thousands, maybe tens of thousands, simply by sharing her story. So she made the decision to return to her body. And <clears throat> on the next day, the evening of the next day, February 3rd, 2002, Anita woke up, sat up, and announced to her startled family who were gathered around her in the hospital, not to worry that she would be okay. Within two days of coming out of the coma, the doctors informed her that her organs had miraculously started functioning again. Within five days, the tumors had shrunk by 70%, and after five weeks, she was completely cancer-free and released to go home for five weeks. And to this day, uh, cancer has not returned, and this miraculous recovery is you know, a complete medical anomaly, cannot be explained. So, at the beginning I mentioned that, that what we were gonna present was only a tiny fraction of the research and the documentation that has been going on in the West that Kelly outlines for us in the field of parapsychology over the last 120 years. Um, so I'm just, uh, putting uh, a few of the books that both Kelly and Stevenson mention as um, what they would consider to be, you know, contemporary uh, anthologies of the science that has been done uh, over that period. And I'll just leave it on the screen for a minute or so, but that completes our presentation. So thank you all for your patience and <laughs> hanging with us today. Well, well, as promised, that certainly uh, expands the, for us the possibilities of consciousness. Um, let's see, I can't see the clock. I wonder if we have a few, we do have a few minutes for discussion. Um, and I wonder maybe we should turn up the lights so we can. Um <laughs> Anyone ha uh, have any uh question or comment that they'd like to uh, share? Sure. Um, <laughs> Ru 
ask him something? Yeah, I think Marty could do it. Could you hand me that mic? Uh, this one here? So we appreciate all the comments. Um, you mentioned early on that that which lies at the root of each of us lies at the root of the cosmos too. Care to explain? <laughs> Well, it's a very old idea, right? That, um, that which we've heard um, and repeated in different traditions in different ways, that um, that man is the or human nature is the microcosm of the macrocosm, and the um, but the the ultimate. Meaning of this, meaning of that, as far as we understand it, and the realization of it, is that it is, is a fusion of micro and macro, and um, and that's what um, some of the examples that I gave. I think the example helps to illustrate it better than the theory. Um, that's why we we um, tried to give you, uh, starting with uh, Whitman and Buck, uh, and then Morjani. Uh, that what that must be like to experience where that boundary, what seems like a boundary to us, um, what seems like the outside, the nature, the world, the cosmos seems like it's out there and we're in here looking out. But, but in these higher states, there's, there's uh, those boundaries, however we define them, uh, whether that's a mental boundary of egotism, the sense of I, I'm a particular person, name and form with a particular history and so on, or um, simply that, oh, I am this, this physical body and no more, that those, all of those barriers which seem to divide oneself from nature, from other human beings, from the cosmos as a whole, dissolve, are dissolved. And, um, and that is uh, a, you know, a core feature um, which are described, described by the mystics um, and which Kelly and James also tried to get to the root of and actually tried to describe some of the characteristics of that. Um, but it, 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 it's so foreign to us, right? Because we are for the most part, uh, feel ourselves you know, captive to a very separated and isolated uh, sense of consciousness and sense of self. So, um, uh, and it's interesting too that even, uh, as we just mentioned a few towards the beginning, that, that modern science is, there are those who are coming to this, that viewpoint uh, with this uh, uh, panpsychic or panentheistic viewpoint. And part of that is that the very simply stated is that the capacity of consciousness that we all experience uh, individually, the, that seer, that perceiver within us, which is looking out through these eyes, these ears, and the senses, uh, that the nature, the ultimate nature of that is like a quantum field. It is inseparable from, it is non-dual with the act of perception, that which appears to be the space between myself and the boundaries of this room, myself and the earth as a whole, myself, the cosmos as a whole. That that, the, the, um, the field in which that perception is taking place is none other than that same consciousness that is in the root of each person and that which is being perceived, uh, what, we, what we call the objects of space, what we think is something out there that is, uh, that is being perceived and which we can identify the characteristics of and map out mathematically and, and, you know, uh, and in very detailed way, that mathematical universe that what is called you know the uh, classical um, of classical physics, which is you know as, as we've mentioned is, is tremendous 
success in that viewpoint. But that, that cosmos, that, that view of the cosmos is just one view. And that all of those things we see as objects that in their ultimate nature, they are also composed of consciousness as well. Um, and this is a, so that, that which we see as objects, that field in which perception takes place, and that, that, that root of consciousness that each of us has, it's a non-dual field, um, which we, again, it's, it's a, uh, a viewpoint of quantum field theory that is really, I think, uh, part of what's opening up a lot of people to, the, uh, to have a, a, a better grasp of what um, the potentialities of consciousness and sort of the, uh, a deeper grasp of the, the essence of it. But um, so again, it's that um, it's a fundamental understanding or recognition or awakening that what, what, what is in oneself and what one sees or perceives as being outside of oneself as being identical. Thank, thank you, Kirk. Um, we're past time and we want to give folks here a uh, an opportunity if they need to leave. Maybe Kirk will stay for some informal discussion afterwards. In, in a moment, I'll call on another member to give the vote of thanks. Just a reminder that um, uh, this, uh, this Tuesday night uh, at the Institute, it, on the, in the ongoing study group, um, there will be um, a discussion uh, looking at passages from uh, uh, Pico Iyer's sh uh, short work on the art of stillness, and on a, um, a Yes magazine uh, excerpt called Less Work, More Living. Um, our next seminar will be, or, or forum perhaps, will be on December 3rd, uh, exploring Shakespeare's Midsummer Night's Dream. Uh, that, that is very promising. That will be uh, given by Marlon Roll, and uh, it'll be at, in Concord House. Um, a reminder during the season of giving that the Institute is supported solely by voluntary donations and um, any donation of any size is, is certainly welcome. Uh, uh, any questions about the IWC can be sent to um, emails that you can find reference on the website. And um, with that, I'd like to call on whoever is... Uh, Jerry Lewin. <laughs> it's Jerry Lewin. Thank you, Jerry Lewin. <laughs> <laughs> My consciousness was limited. <laughs> well, I, I know that all of you are feeling, as I am, that we've had this rich feast of ideas. And I know we are all extremely grateful for this beautiful outline and in-depth analysis and description of fundamental thinkers going beyond life and death and bringing to us true aspects of boundless consciousness. And um, I think that Kirk's brilliant synthesis of science, psychology, and spirituality um, has indicated to us the important role of creative thought and creative imagination in exploring uh, consciousness and indeed boundless consciousness. Um, we've been through today's forum re-examining different ideas of human nature. And from this, we have seen beyond really the vision, so to speak, of materialism and even into visions seemingly beyond death, um, as were just brought out in the wonderful examples we had. And these give us a sense that the idea of human nature is one of unfoldment over lifetimes, really. And it gives us so much to think about. How would we live with this knowledge? Would we change our lives in any way? And truly, I think the studies themselves really give us a lot of strength in understanding the importance of intuitive perception and innate ideas. And that in itself is like a wonderful gift prior to Thanksgiving. 
And we will no doubt continue to um, think about these ideas and raise questions after we leave today for a long time. And so, um, Kirk, we wish to thank you for being our wonderful guide on this journey to boundless consciousness. Thank you. Thanks, Joe. That was very nice. Physicalists have looked into your presentation.